Bienvenidos. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. So thank you for coming here this, e this afternoon, um, La Habana 500 at 500. This is a wonderful celebration with three campuses, CUNY campuses participating. Uh, so I want to welcome you to one of them, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Um, and um, I'm Professor Jose Luis Morin. I'm the chair of Latin American and Latinx studies here at John Jay College. So on behalf of the college, on behalf of our department, uh, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. Um, and I want to recognize our other collaborators, uh, Osos Community College, um, uh, who's also represented here. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> City College of New York, uh, which has also been participating. And we have a wonderful panel. Yes. We have a wonderful panel for you this afternoon. Um, and our moderator this afternoon is one of our wonderful professors here at John Jay, uh, uh, Professor John Gutierrez. So um, with that, I will introduce John, John Gutierrez, ask him to come up, and um, he will uh, present our panelists for the day. Thank you. So uh, as Jose Luis said, my name is John Gutierrez. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Latin American and Latinx Studies. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you uh, to John Jay this afternoon. Uh, today, as Jose Luis said, as part of a CUNY-wide celebration uh, of the quincentenary uh, of the founding of Havana, Cuba, uh, we've gathered uh, a remarkable panel of experts to examine the long intertwining histories of Havana and New York City. Um, to any New Yorker uh, or, or any uh, adopted New Yorker or anybody who spent any time in this city um, and has also spent time in Havana, uh, there's something familiar about the Cuban capital. Uh, it's bustling spirit, it's fast-talking denizens, it's rich cultural life, it's history as a center of commerce, it's rich immigrant tradition, it's history of racial segregation, and increasingly, it's growing chasm between the haves and have-nots. When President William McKinley delivered his third annual address to Congress in December of 1899, he noted the, quote, ties of singular intimacy that bound a newly independent Cuba to the United States. No two cities reflected the depth of that intimate relationship between the two countries, as did New York and Havana. In light of this, and in concert with the events marking Havana's 500th anniversary in Cuba and elsewhere, it makes sense that CUNY, New York's flagship public university, would be the place to reflect and examine New York City and Havana's more than two centuries long back and forth, and very significantly, the men and women from Cuba who made New York their home. Uh, today's speakers have written and lectured extensively on the Cuban experience in New York City, and we're lucky to have them here to guide us as we delve into this fascinating part of New York and Cuban history. Uh, I'd like to introduce the speakers in the order of their presentations, and after the presentations are complete, I'll open the floor up to you all, and we'll continue the conversation. Um, I begin with my colleague, uh, Professor Lisandro Perez, who is a professor here in the Department of Latin American and Latinx Studies. Um, he is the author of Sugar, Cigars, and Revolution, The Making of Cuban New York, uh, which explores the long relationship between La Habana and New York City with a special focus on the 19th century. The book received the 2019 Literary Honorable Mention for Studies of Latinos in the U.S. from Casa de las Américas in La Habana. Nancy Raquel Mirabal is a historian and director of the U.S. Latino Latina Studies Program at the University of Maryland and author of Suspect Freedoms, The Racial and Sexual Politics of Cubanidad in New York, 1823 to 1957. The work which one reviewer wrote, quote, rescues the rich history of Cubans of color in the United States from obscurity, end quote, explores the history of Cuban racial and sexual politics in New York during the 19th and 20th centuries. And uh, finally, uh, a legend here at CUNY, uh, Orlando Hernandez is a uh, professor emeritus at Hostos Community College, uh, an acclaimed uh, critic and translator. He has published articles on Jose Marti and uh, Eugenio Maria de Hostos and their contributions to the 19th century anti-colonial struggles in Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. His forthcoming book, Eugenio Maria de Hostos, Adalid de la Inclusividad, focuses on Hostos' advocacy for equality and human rights. We're very lucky to have them all. Please join me in welcoming uh, them all to John Jay. Uh, and Professor Perez, the floor is yours, sir. So good afternoon, everyone, and good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. 
uh, from the uh, organizing committee of this wonderful event that's taking place all of this week <clears throat> in CUNY. Uh, I want to especially thank the, the two individuals that I was in contact with about uh, getting this organized and, and from their organized, uh, from their perspective, Orlando Hernandez, who talked, and of course Wallace, Wallace Edgecombe, who's here, both emeritus from, uh, from Ostos. And I think uh, my thanks also to the School of Visual Arts at Ostos, the three presidents of the three campuses, uh, and, um, and especially want to um, indicate my gratitude to uh, President Carol Mason, uh, who supported also this on our campus here at John Jay. So <clears throat> I want to talk about the reasons why I took the project that resulted in the book uh, that uh, was published last year, um, entitled Sugar, Cigars, and Revolution, The Making of Cuban New York. Um, I had two things in mind uh, in, in doing this. First, I wanted to give New York its due in terms of the Cuban presence in the U.S., uh, I am not a historian, actually. I only, I only play one on TV. <laughs> so, uh, I'm actually a sociologist, and most of my work has been on the Cuban community uh, in a contemporary sense, uh, both its uh, political mobilization, its lobbying, all of that. And in Miami specifically, I was for 25 years on the faculty at Florida International University in Miami before coming here. Um, and, and so it's more on the contemporary community that I've written, but I long realized that there was this sort of vacuum uh, when it came to New York. Uh, I knew that it had to be important, and particularly in the 19th century, the original plan was to do the 19th, and they are 19th, and then the early 20th century, up to the Cuban Revolution, really. Um, but there was so much material I, find, I found in the 19th century that it was just, uh, uh, I had to stop there in the 19th century, right? And this is, this is in the 19th century. So I wanted to give New York its due. There is an extensive bibliography, as you know, on the Florida cigar-making communities <clears throat> that there's quite a bit of information on. And of course, in the post-revolutionary migration since 1959. But New York was this sort of, you know, um, there hadn't been really a very serious study of it. Um, uh, and I'm so glad to see other studies coming out, inc including Nancy Mirabal's. There's also been another study coming up. Uh, uh, Jesse Hofsrung Garskov has just published a book uh, out of Princeton, uh, also on, on the topic, uh, although a different time period. <clears throat> so I wanted to give New York a view. The other, the other reason uh, was that uh, I knew from just personal, for personal reasons, that there had to be this extensive connection between New York and Havana because I had heard about it since growing up. Um, I grew up in Havana uh, hearing New York stories. Okay? My great-grandfather on my mother's side and his son, my grandfather on my mother's side, both studied in New York City. They were sent up to study in the Hudson Valley. Okay? Uh, my father studied in Long Island uh, because his father wanted him to learn English. Right? That's why, uh, for example, in Cuba, he put me in Lafayette School where I was there with a bunch of Americans, including Wally, who's here, who was also <laughs> went to Lafayette School, and Hal Claypack, who was on the panel the other day. <clears throat> so for a personal reason, I also wanted to see this connection between Havana and Europe. So I want, I want to really, uh, I have limited time, so I wanted to just impress upon you two points that I hope to develop here today. One is the very early establishment of New York in the Cuban imaginary. That is, the notion that New York starts, and it's New York, it's the U.S., but specifically New York, starts replace, replacing Spain as that other place in the Cuban consciousness, that other place that <clears throat> you look out to when you're in an island and you look for, you know, style, uh, ideas, um, uh, essentially a model for society, all of those things, the idea that, that you try to assuage your insularity Right? By looking outside, New York very early through the processes that I'm going to be talking about became that place in the Cuban consciousness, that other place. The second is, as I also established, is that very largely the history of Latinx New York, to use the term now and apply it back, right? but the history of Latin Americans, let's say, in New York City, <clears throat> in the 19th century in its origins is primarily a Cuban story. Right? Although Cubans are now eighth or ninth in terms of nationalities in New York, right? Um, in the 19th century, it is very largely a Cuban story. So I start the story, let me see, um, with the arrival, let me get some water, <coughs> with the arrival of 
December 15, 1823, of Father Felix Varela y Morales. I start with Varela because he is the first, to me, identifiable Cuban, that is Cuban by identity, right, to live uh, in New York. And not only that, he had a tremendous impact on the city, more perhaps than any other Cuban who's lived in the city. I mean impact on the city, because he arrived here on that date thinking, right, that he was um, going to just stay for a few days because he had just left Gibraltar. He had gone to represent the interests of Cuba before the Spanish Cortes, and Fernando VII came back into power and started imprisoning everybody, and so he barely escaped to Gibraltar, took the first ship out, and had arrived in New York. Right? And he thought, well, I'll just be here before I go to Cuba. Of course, in Havana, they declared a death sentence against him, and instead of going back right away, he spent the next 26 years in New York, never going back to Cuba. Right? And he became a rather important figure in the New York Archdiocese. Right? In fact, in very, in, in, in from the early periods, if we're talking about 1823, we're talking about the period right, of, of, of when the church battled <coughs> you know, the anti-papists and anti-immigrant elements and so forth, right? the uh, attacks of the nativists. So he was here for all of that. So I start the story there. But in reality, the story that I have to tell here starts much earlier than that, to understand really why it is that Varela ends up in New York, why it is that when he goes there, right, instead of going, when he arrives in that ship, the Draper, in South Street, he doesn't head to a church, he doesn't, he doesn't know anybody in New York, but he knows somebody, right, in a counting house, a commercial house, and that has to do with the commerce that existed, and that's what I want to talk about. So the, uh, the beginning of the story really goes to the British occupation of Havana. 1762 to 1763, the British take over Havana for about 11 months, right? They, um, they militarily assault the city. Here's their taking over, marching into the Moro Castle. Uh, <clears throat> and for 11 months, what happens is that there is an establishment of commerce with the British North American colonies. And this is, in a sense, the tail end of what Alejandro de la Fuente was talking about the other day at Ostos, right? When, when Alejandro was talking about how Havana was this hub, this axis of trade, right? for the Spanish, the first port where Spanish ships arrived, the last port where they left, it was all, everything converged on Havana, and that was the importance of Havana uh, in that time. But this was, again, royal trade, right? This was Spanish royal trade. What happens with this occupation is that now ships from the North American, from everywhere, start going into Havana. And commercial ties are established as a result of this occupation. Two other events follow that's also, that are also important. <clears throat> the, uh, slave rebellion in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, Haiti, right, which destroys the uh, sugar production of that colony and therefore causes the price of sugar to increase greatly. And also at the same time, practically the granulation, the discovery of the granulation of sugar by Jean-Étienne Boré in Louisiana. Both of those things make it attractive for essentially a criollo aristocracy, nascent aristocracy in Havana to start investing in sugar. Right? And they invest in it in a big way. They start buying land, right? they start uh, producing sugar on a world market. Now Cuba, uh, Havana not only is a hub right, where you know, things come in and out, now Havana has something to sell. And they sell it to the United States, or with, uh, but at first the British North American colonies, because um, it, it is in New York, right, that most of that sugar goes to. Um, the Spanish are not, are not com it's not part of their monopoly system to have sugar in there as it was for tobacco, for example. Uh, and the, the Cuban sugar that was responsible, right, for uh, what we call the sugar revolution in Cuba um, goes primarily to New York. New York was the sugar refining center, right, of, of the United States. Uh, there were actually 16 sugar refineries at one point in New York City. Uh, and the sugar, of course, that Cuba was producing was in caked, essentially. It was in these brown filtered cakes that came in, and they still had to be refined. So when they came in, they were sold then to the refineries here in New York, and it was through New York that a lot of that sugar came. But that, that, um, that um, sugar revolution had a tremendous impact uh, on Cuba because essentially it was a, it, there was a new social class that arose 
it was called the sugarocracy. Manuel, Manuel Moreno Fraginals invents that term in referring to la sacarocracia, right, as he calls it in, in the sugar mill. And that class, again, starts investing more and more in land. They invest in technology because by this time you have the steam engine, right, and the steam engine essentially is able to power these greater grinders and so forth. So you have investment in land and technology, and of course, if you have more land and you have more technology and you have more capacity to grind cane, you need more slaves. And it is in this early period of the 19th century that you have the biggest period of the importation of slaves into Cuba, responding to the sugar revolution. And here's some, here's some you know, uh, indication of that. 1792, at the cusp, at the beginning of the sugar revolution, the total production of Cuba was about 13,800 tons. By 1860, that production goes to half a million, more than half a million tons. And here you have the great processing facilities that these, end, that these mills had, which again, a lot of this machinery was imported from the United States. So you start getting a very early traffic right, in this. In terms of the population, it is an incredible, an incredible impact, right? It's in, uh, what, what I find incredible also is that if you look at 70, right down here in 1774, I guess this isn't pointing. Uh, in 1774, after nearly three centuries of a Spanish, uh, of a Spanish colonialism in Cuba, the total population of the island, if we follow just the line first, not the bars, right, but the line, the entire population of Cuba was 172,000, which is probably uh, less than would live within three blocks of Cuba, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, 172,000. And then you see the tremendous increase in population. Just in 1827, it grows to 704,000. And by 1841, it's past a million. Demographically, that's what happens. In terms of composition, the bars indicate the, the distribution by race, white, free-colored slave, right? And you go from a 56.9% white population down to 41.6 in this census, and look at the slave population, from 22% up to uh, 43%. So this is, this is a tremendous thing. And, and so that sugar, right, that is being produced, and that is going primarily to New York City. And <clears throat> critical, and this is a view from, of South Street, uh, from Maiden Lane, uh, and you see these are the ships coming in from all kinds of purposes. And aligning South Street, uh, you have these counting houses. And the counting houses uh, were essentially these commercial establishments that received the sugar from the planters, from this new class of the Criolla aristocracy, from the Sacarocracia. They sold that sugar for them on consignment. They opened accounts for them, and they kept accounts for them here in New York. And in so doing, of course, not only did they act as agents for the selling of sugar, right, but also they acted as agents for just about everything else in a growing commercial traffic right, between Havana right, and New York. So what we're looking at here is the origins of that connection. It becomes a very strong connection. Okay? Uh, so, so, when, so for example, not only did they sell the sugar, but also they bought the machinery for the mills a lot of that machinery came from the Hudson Valley, from places like the West Point Foundry, which is uh, what used to be in Cold Spring, right? And they had all these machinery and everything that they would buy. They bought carriages to drive around in, in Havana. They bought their linens. They bought their, you know, uh, their uh, everything that they needed to show off their new wealth because they, had be they were becoming in incredibly wealthy, right? And things like shopping trips to New York, right? And also the education of their children in New York City or in this area. So they would actually send these children to these commercial houses, and the commercial houses would receive them, clothe them, look for a boarding school in New York, in the Hudson Valley or in New Jersey, and educate them. And we know all this in a lot of detail because in the New York Public Library are the complete records, well, I'm gonna say complete records, they're never complete, right? But uh, pretty much the records, right? of the Moses Taylor and Company. Moses Taylor and Company was the largest of these consignment, which made its money from the sugar trade. And it was one of these, and, 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 and the archives are incredible on that, both in terms of the accounts, the ledgers, and everything of these, of these, uh, of these sales, right? Uh, and, uh, and also the, uh, uh, all of these activities, like receiving children at the dock, you know, uh, uh, make, making sure that they were placed in boarding schools, attending to their, to their allowance, to whatever came up. I mean, it's fascinating, the record that's, that's in the Moses Taylor papers in the, in the uh, New York Public Library. Right? Um, 
So here are a, couple, a few quotes to, that underscore this, right? The combined value, this is from Ronald E.I. and the old Cuba trade, 1964, the combined value of export and imports for the Cuba trade consistently ranked third or fourth place relative to the total commerce of the United States between 1835 and 1865. That's how important that trade was. Sugar coming this way, eventually tobacco also coming this way, cigars and tobacco, and then the, all the manufactured goods that were going back. Uh, Albion, who writes on the rise of Port Cuba, New York, uh, the rise of New York Port Cuba, while still belonging to Spain, became more and more an economic dependency of the United States in general and of New York in particular. And then there's a quote from Simón Camacho, who has his wonderful book published in 1864. He was a Venezuelan, Cosas de los Estados Unidos. And he says, Cuba, as far as I know, is where you can find the largest number of Cubans. But besides Cuba, nowhere else are there more Cubans than on the docks of the Columbia or the Marion on sailing days. Someone said it appears as if New York is a neighborhood of Havana, and I could not disagree. Notice he says, notice he says uh, New York as a neighborhood of Havana. At this point, Havana is actually a larger city right, than New York at the time. right? So, a neighborhood of Havana. And here, you have it in numbers. Number of passengers, I put this together. This is all before 1850. This is way before, right? the Civil War, right? And this is, you have the number of passengers arriving in New York from Cuban ports <coughs> and then from Latin American and Spanish ports combined, right? And there are more, Cu more ships arriving, more passengers arriving from Cuban ports directly than there are from all ports of Latin America and Spain combined, right? Which tells the story. So this is a story like, like, like in any New York story, it starts with the port. Like any Cuban story, it starts with sugar, right? And that's the beginning of this connection, right? So uh, let, me, let me move on. Um, I want to just go through a couple of things. Um, this, for example, if you take just the importance, political importance of this, prominent Cuban residents or sojourners in New York City. And this is like a who's who in many ways, right? I'm not, we're just talking before 1868, right? I mean, Marilyn Morales, Jose Maria Heredia, Jose Antonio Saco, Jose de Luz y Caballero, you know, uh, La Condesa de Merlin, right? Uh, Gertrude Gomez de Avellaneda, just uh, the poet Cenea, Cenea the Aldamas, Cirilo de Valle Verde, and Emilia Casanova, of course. I mean, it goes on. Domingo de Gorgoria, all of these, right? So these were just that prominent figures that I can identify that came back. So very early, Cubans have an image or get an image in New York, not of rep what was not represented so much at that point, uh, what really New Yorkers were really seeing in terms of, of Cubans were these sugarocrats, right? And for example, here um, I have in my book a very detailed wedding, right, that takes place in Old St. Patrick's, right, between a uh, uh, young American bride, uh, part of the kind of higher classes in New York, and uh, a sugar planter who's much older than her, but who has fabulous amount of money, according to the New York Herald. And it was a sensational wedding. We're talking about 1859, right when, before the Gilded Age. I mean, it was like scandalous in terms of the conspicuous consumption of the wedding, right? So we so we've see this, this, uh, this importance of New York very early uh, in the history um, of New York and of Cuba. And then there's a number of political implications of that, right? Annexationism, right, is rooted here in New York, right? And uh, the, uh, one of the first newspapers of Cubans in New York was La Verdad, which was an annexationist newspaper. Of course, the sugar planters are looking to annex Cuba uh, to the U.S. because they're concerned about the demographics of too, much, too many slaves, right? Uh, and therefore, what they'd like to do is eliminate the slave trade but continue slavery. And of course, the U.S. is a good model for that, right? And they feel that they can, you know, hey, you know, they can, they can, they can do all right. So this is a newspaper that was published here. It wasn't a commercial venture. In fact, it's dense. You know, it's this whole sheet, right, with, you know, just diatribes and so forth. And, and uh, um, the Cuban flag, which, of course, originates uh, in New York. It is sewn, it conceived, sewn by annexationists in a boarding house and flies for the first time in the corner of Nassau and Fulton in front of the, um, of the uh, New York Sun newspaper, which had, you know, was, was essentially supporting all of this. And this is in the New York Sun. I finally found it, right, in the Historical Society, the first, I think, depiction of the Cuban flag uh, 
because, of course, the New York Sun, I said, if the New York Sun had the flag out front, it must have had it in the newspaper, right? So that's May 1st, I want to say, 1850, right, which is the first depiction of the, of the Cuban flag, okay, as it is, you know, in, in, in paper. Uh, <clears throat> one other thing I want to say, and again, I'm running through the legacy, then I'll be finished uh, quickly. Uh, the war that comes in, I, you know, we all know the Eastern <laughs> started it. It wasn't started by these guys who were in Havana and making a lot of money, obviously. When you're making a lot of money from all the sugar, you don't want to start a war. But it was the Easterners who started the war. And that has a big impact. Uh, that has a tremendous impact on New York because essentially, even though they didn't start the war, many of these Havana sugarocrats had to leave. They were being you know, harassed by the voluntarios and so forth, and they felt they had, they had to leave. And so where are they going to go? They're going to go where they have the money, right? Where they have the money in accounts already. And so here you have, and this is what I was saying before about being a, a Cuban story, if we trace, I've kind of reconstructed what would be the Hispanic population in New York according to the decennial censuses, and you see this spike in 1870 where, again, there were, I, I found nearly 3,000 enumerated persons born in Cuba, not even to include their children, born in Cuba, right, uh, in the 1870 census. And I've spent a lot of time in the 1870 census. And just, just let me go through this very quickly, just to show you that uh, in the 1870 census, I'm able to locate practically every figure of importance, right, of the Havana sugarocracy. These are the people that uh, were responsible for the publication of El Siglo. They had been uh, autonomistas from a very long time, actually reformists and so forth. They're all there. Enrique Piñero, Carlos de Castillo, Juan Manuel Macias, the banker Feses, the hermanos Cisneros. The Moras, who invested very heavily in property on 12th and 13th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. Jose Manuel Mestre, their lawyer. Miguel Aldama, Leonardo del Monte. Antonio Bachilleri Morales, right? I can actually give you their addresses. They, you know, they just, they came, right? And they're there in the 1870 census, right? And this was part of, again, this, this notion of New York being this place that was very central to Cubans. Uh, and also it was a place where the armies of this war uh, were being outfitted, okay? Here's a receipt. Uh, the person is Manuel Quesada, who was a general uh, in, the, in the Cuban War, of, in the 10-year in the war. Uh, he is sent to New York to buy ammunition. He walks into the store of Mr. Charles Pond on 179 Broadway, you know, and in 1871 in New York, he can go in and buy um, 2,000 Enfield rifles, 2,000 sets of I don't know what. He bought actually two Gatling cannons Right, literally, just walking in the store. This is not underground arms dealers, right? This is Mr. Pond with his stationery and his invoice and everything, all right? Uh, and this is also, by the way, in the Moses Taylor papers, okay? Um, uh, and by the way, uh, many of those uh, New Yorkers uh, went back after the war was over, but many of them stayed, as you see. And Greenwood has a very large number of this sugarocracy buried there. Every year I give a tour. Right of my dead Cubans tour of Greenwood, <laughs> and also you know there's just a whole bunch of them that are buried there, right? And in Greenwood, um, here's the tomb of Miguel Aldama. Right? Uh, this is, by the way, are the Moras. All of these are the Moras who invested there in Tolte. So, two legacies of this. First, Martí. Right? Martí decides in New York is where he's got to do his revolution. It's the closest place to Cuba. Right? There's a ship leaving every week, every day. You can put a letter on it. Right? And he's here from. 1880 to 1895. Some people in Cuba talked to me at La Tapa de Martí, the stage of Martí in New York. It wasn't on the stage of Martí in New York. It was where he lived the majority of his adult life, right? So one of the things that, that this legacy does is we have Martí here who starts a movement. The second thing is that finally in 1886, there, after 1886, New York is replaced as the most important community by Cubans. And it's replaced by Ybor City. Where does Ybor City, where does Ybor City start? It starts in New York, right? And I can tell you, in 1880, El Principe de Gales Cigars, which is the brand of Ibor, was located at 190 Pearl Street. Ibor lived at 218 East 14th Street. Eduardo Manrara lived on 13th Street, right? La Flor de Sanchez y Aya was on 130 Maiden Lane. If you look at the map, that is literally around the corner from 190 Pearl Street. And these guys lived in Brooklyn and West 59th Street nearby. These four individuals, were the ones who founded New York's uh, Ybor City in Tampa, where the first cigar rolled out of the factory of La Flor de Sanchez Ciaya in 1886, followed two days later by the first cigar out of the Principe de Gales factory. So it was in New York that the whole plot 
to start essentially a company town, right, in, in, uh, in, in Tampa, right, by Cuban emigrants was first hatched in New York. So there's this legacy, right, of, of New York. So I think I've exceeded my time. Let me just stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Uh, there were so many people that I got a chance to meet, and I just want to thank everyone. And I want to especially thank Lourdes Torres for making sure that I had a hotel room, that I knew where I was going, and just thank you so much for everything. Um, so it, it's funny. Uh, I think Les, Lisandro and I, this is our, we've done this before. We've talked together <laughs> about Cuba. And so this is uh, the second time. And it's so funny. I am a historian. I'm a trained historian. And that we could look at very similar periods and come with something different. And I think that that's what's fascinating when we have this conversation. So my book is a 100-year history of mostly Afro-Cubans in New York. And I do look at Cubans, but I also look at the politics of whiteness. I look at all of these questions because annexationism cannot be studied without the politics of whiteness. And why was that? Was because of the Haitian Revolution and the fear that Cuba could become another Haiti. And so you have newspapers like La Verdad that are basically saying, um, I have the exact quote. This is why I bring my book. I always tell folks, I don't bring my book to show it off. I bring it because I forget what I write. And then I can be reminded. Uh, but in La Verdad, in 1848, it says, we consider a Cuban every person, we consider a Cuban every person born in Cuba. And what we wish is that white people be born by thousands every hour. So for me, the history of Cubans in New York is one that must take into consideration afro cubanidad Or you just don't know that history. And so I argue in the book, for instance, I started as early as 1823 with Varela. Uh, Varela, as uh, Lisandro tells us, and as Jerry Pollo tells us, is really the first to create a Cuban exile community in 1823. But Varela, if you look at the sources, loses favor with his students because he himself is an abolitionist. He wants to end slavery. And so you see in the narrative that he's somewhat lessened, and then he kind of comes back. So when I looked at the 19th century, I was looking at Rafael Serra, who was a close friend to Jose Marti. And as I argue, Jose Marti could not have been as powerful or successful without Rafael Serra. Rafael Serra was the one who said to Jose Marti, if you do not include labor, if you do not include an analysis of what's going to happen to Cuba after the end of slavery, the Partido Revolucionario Cubano will mean nothing. It will mean nothing. Sotero Figueroa, who was Puerto Rican, did la, la sección puertorriqueña of the PRC. Martín Moruo Delgado, who wrote, who wrote La Cuestión Obrera. And so when we look at the 19th century, I was looking at the role that the labor movement had with those cigar factories. These were labor organizers. And so labor was in constant competition with the nationalist movement. And why? Because the owners of those cigar factories were heading the nationalist movements, and the people who were rebelling were their workers. So there was this constant tension back and forth. I also played with periodization, and that was a big mistake. <laughs> because it took a long time to write this book. And so instead of ending in 1898, I went all the way up to 1957. So my book ends up, I could not stop. And friends of mine, just put the pen down, just stop. But I went from 1823 to 1957. And the reason for that was because oftentimes the story of Cubans in New York ends in 1898, and the question is what happens afterwards? Well, it's a really dramatic and important history as well. And so I have quotes here by Michel Rolf Trujillo. Michel Rolf Trujillo wrote Silencing the Past. He is a scholar of Haitian descent. And it reminds me of what it means to write a history, an impossible history, what we call an impossible history. Because the period from 1898 to 1957 in New York is almost unknown. It's though like you had the Spanish-American War, the US intervention in Cuba, right? The occupation, and then you had the Cuban Revolution. Well, what happened in between? And New York played a very big role in that history in between as well. 
So what I looked at, and then Christina Sharp just is a theorist, a black feminist theorist, and I do a lot of black feminist work. This is what drives this book. Is, is basically the idea that when we look at 1898, what we find is that Rafael Serra goes back to Cuba, right? Martin Moruo Delgado goes back to Cuba, and they have a hard time there, but also the first president in Cuba is Tomás Estrada Palma, who was a U.S. citizen, who had been in the United States for 30 years, and is a hand-picked first president of Cuba. They all know each other. So I argued that there is a New York, almost Cuban diasporic experience that is creating the first few years in Cuba. So think about that connection as well. So let me see. This, do I point this way or this way? Okay. So I'm gonna, as someone who plays with periodization, I'm not gonna start in the beginning and end, but I'm just gonna kind of talk a little bit. The reason, this is the cover of my book, and the reason for that is I'll tell you a story. When I first started doing this research, I wanted to write history of women. I wanted to write history of Afro-Cuban women. So when I went to the Schomburg, they said to me, we don't have any of that history, but we know this wonderful woman named Melba Alvarado, who you might know here, and she can tell you everything you need to know. I ended up working with Melba Alvarado for 20 years. Right? Mel Barado was a, one of the first female presidents of the Afro-Cuban club, El Club Cubano Interamericano, which was founded in South Bronx in 1945, all the way up to the 2000s. She just passed away at almost 100 years old. She had a lot of history. She migrated from uh, Cuba to New York in the 1930s. And so what she said to me after a few interviews, and the first interview, she didn't trust me. It took her a long time to trust me, and then she trusted me. And then she told me the truth. But she said, mira hija, hay un club que se llamaba el Club Julio Antonio Mella y estaba ella misma en el East Harlem. And I was like, pero Melba, that doesn't make any sense. A club named after the founder of the Cuban Communist Party <laughs> in, in Cuba, and they founded a club in New York. And she said, yeah, mija, así, así, you know. And that's the way history works. People tell you something, you go in the archive, you don't necessarily find it. And then I found this photo. And once I found this photo, I said, it was right. She was right, right? And so what it says here is, El Club, you know, Recuerdo de la Inigración de la Logia 4763, Julio Antonio Mella, IWO, New York City. Ah, okay, now I can do research. I can do research on IWO. And then I went back to Melba. I said, pero Melba, tú no me dijiste que la gente era comunista. That's the IWO, International Workers' Order. And she goes, oh, sí, se me olvidó ese detalle. <laughs> <laughs> ese detalle se me olvidó. And I was like, oh, but a tremendo detalle, right? <laughs> so, wow. So that turned out to be this whole kind of history that I ended up having to write. And the reason it's an impossible history is that it's a history for many Cubans that is a difficult history. It's a painful history, right? So what you see also, she would say, era un club donde no había racismo, because for her, seeing it being racially mixed, for her meant that there was no racism. Why was that? Because that was not her experience once she sets up el club cubano interamericano. So this is the program for Julio Antonio Mella here in New York City um, and the club. And so I wrote the history of how the club started. It took me, and I'm sure Lisandro can can vouch for it. it took me six months just to find out when the club was formed and when it ended. Because <laughs> those dates are not always there. This is actually a painting by a communist painter, Glinton Kamp, of El Club Mella. And what's amazing about this club is that you have the Afro-Cuban women and men in the front of the image, right? So that there's a recognition of Afro-Cuban radical politics in the 1920s and the 1930s, which is incredible because we don't have that history. So this is the Club de Dama, the Club Julio Antonio Mella, and this is when I realized that the club was founded in 1932. And so this particular club gets founded as a logia, a lodge of the International Workers' Order, which was organizing all of these immigrants. But it also is a precursor. Why is this club important? It's not only to detail the radical history of Cubans who are working with Puerto Ricans, who are working with the Irish, the Italian. It's important because it gives us some insight into what did Cubans do after 1898. How did they create community in New York? What did that community look like? And so this gives us some ideas. And the women who are part of the Comité de Damas, or el Club de Damas, were actually very active. 
There's a lot of the writings. There were organizers. Um, they were very supportive of women's rights. They're trying to recreate and think, what does it mean to be a Cuban immigrant? Why is that important? Because before 1898, Cubans didn't think that way. Cubans were like, when we go back to Cuba, when we go back to Cuba, this is how we're going to create a community. Now, that Cuba that they had in mind does not exist. So they have to create a community for themselves here in the United States. This is part of a Club Cubano Interamericano, and this is the first meeting in 1945. So just a little. The Julio Antonio Mella Club becomes important because the founders of this club are the ones that create the next club. And they create a club that goes from one that was racially mixed to one that becomes Afro-Cuban. And the reason for that is that by this club ends in 1940 because of the rise of World War II, anti-communism, the Red Scare, and so any kind of movement, that kind of club of the 1930s, that was, so for instance, members of El Club, El Club Julio Antonio Mella, they went to Spain to fight in the Spanish Civil War. They organized in terms of labor organizers. They were organizing, so there was El Club, uh, there's a Club Martí that was founded in 1935 in Harlem. Una organización cubana antiimperialista that was founded in Harlem in 1935. There's all of these clubs that were organized. So when I began to do this research, I thought, oh my goodness, this is an incredible history. And so when this club ends, they end because the IWO is now being investigated, and they're losing their power, and um, they're being sued because it is a club that was supported laborers and workers. Uh, Afro-Cubans are left out, and then they realized they had an event in honor of Antonio Maceo. They invited El Club Ateneo, which was a white Cuban club. They did not show up. They left them stranded. And that day is when Afro-Cubans decided we need to create a club for ourselves. And that was the beginning of El Club Cubano Interamericano with Generoso Pedroso right here. I also have La Verdad with the quote that I gave you, so a reading of it. Um, this is also in, uh, in La Verdad, which tells you the, the connection between Haiti and Jamaica and the anti-blackness, right, at that time, which was key. Um, it's a long one, but basically it's one where they're saying we don't want another Haiti in Cuba. This is El Mulato, which was actually a newspaper that was published by Cubans who were against the annexationists. So there's this radical group outside that don't want to annex, don't want Cuba to be annexed to the United States, want it to be independent. They're abolitionists, and they actually created a newspaper called El Mulato, which when in 1854 is pretty radical. And so El Mulato gets published here in New York. And in New York, this newspaper is read by Frederick Douglass, Martin Delaney, many of the African-American, um, Henry Highland Garnett, and they get very involved in what's happening with Cuba in terms of race, and they create the Cuban Anti-Slavery Society in 1872 here in New York. These are African-American men who have just kind of the Civil War has ended, and they have their own club. And they're inspired by El Mulato. Um, we can go. This, is, this was uh, Josefina Toledo, who is a, a Cuban scholar, who um, I was very inspired by her quote. She said, many of the figures that helped found the Cuban Revolutionary Party of 1891 remain in the darkest anonymity today, relegated there by bourgeois historiography, which does not find it convenient to highlight the vanguard, vanguard role of the working class, the cigar workers, topographers, and workers from the masses of emigrated revolutionaries in New York. So it's true, the history of these kind of workers hasn't always been part of the larger analysis. This is Rafael Serra, who I mentioned earlier, who was a, a key figure um, in New York, who goes back to Cuba in 1909, and then he passes away there. And these are members of La Liga. So La Liga de Instrucción, La Liga Sociedad de Institución Recreo in 1891 was founded here in New York in 1891, and it was founded by Rafael Serra. And if you notice, they're mostly Afro-Cuban men and women, and they organize a club just for people of color. And the reason for this is they feel that the PRC and that other nationalist movements, separatist clubs, are not taking their um, concerns seriously. So they organize among themselves. <laughs> 
right? And so what that tells us, it comes as a lo colectiva, that this was a radical political group. They published things, they wrote newspapers, they were very active. This is Teofilo Dominguez, who wrote one of the most important books, Figuras y Figuritas. Um, and he wrote it in 18, it gets published in 1899, which is after the war, as a way to remind people that Afro-Cuban men and women were very much part of the revolutionary effort. And, and this is a book. And this is the Antonio Marcel event that I was telling you about, the Afro-Cubans had organized and none of the white Cubans showed up. <laughs> and that started El Club Cubano Interamericano. Eso es lo que te digo, es tremendo. Yeah, you have Batista, you have Raul Roa, you have Jesus Colon, Clayton Powell. So lo que tú ves allí, I'm sorry, not everybody speaks Spanish here. So what you see there, I get excited, I start speaking Spanish. Lo que tú ves allí, una historia, no, it's a history with like African Americans and Afro Cubans that go way back, but it's still connected, right? Adam Clayton Powell está allí con Jesús Colón y Roca Bruna, es un Afro Cubano scholar who was based at Howard University and had connections here. Mm -hmm. And then the musicians, Eusebia Cosme, eh, Trio Servando, Marcelino Guerra, you know, era tremendo la fiesta. And, and Melba, when I interviewed her, she said, mija, we had their tables and seats up there, so it's going to be equal, y no llegó ni uno. Y cuando fue esa tremenda fiesta, todo allí vacío. So that broke, that broke their heart in a way, right? And then I want to go. This is a, a, the club <coughs> in the 1940s. And I love this picture because you have Antonio Maceo in the middle, Jose Marti, Simon Bolivar, Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very diasporic experience. But I also see like it's an impossible history, right? Because unless you have the photographs, you don't really see it or imagine it that way. Um, and also how beautifully dressed, and women were very much involved in the organizing, really at the center of it. This is another one, and that bust of Antonio Marcel is gonna become very important in the story. Again, these are El Club Cubano Interamericano, many of the members. They had networks, they would find people housing, they would find them jobs, they would have sewing classes. It was a very important club. This club, Ayuda El Monumento Martí Marcel, that monument that you have of Jose Martí right over here, right? I think in Central Park, it was supposed to be Martí and Marcel. Mm -hmm. And so they were raising money, uh, and the book details a whole history of why it should have been Martí Marcel. But in the end, uh, the white Cuban clubs did not want anything to do with supporting Marcel, so it only became Martí. So there's a chapter that talks about all of that politics. And if you look here, it says, Ayuda el Monumento Martí Marcel. And Marcel gets, and to this day, as Melba would say, there's still nothing that shows Marcel. And Marcel was very big in the African American community. That's why, if you look at African Americans, many are called Maceo Parker. They use the name Marcel. And then this is Melba getting an award. This is, uh, that's Celia Cruz right there. So many of these clubs were one of the few places where performers of color could perform and have other Afro-Cubans there watching them because most of these clubs could be segregated. That's Minnie Minoso. Ah. Oh, Arsenio Rodriguez. Ahí está. Ah? Oh, no. Anterior. A ver. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I'm going backwards. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened with my own PowerPoint. No, the last one era, um, and then we'll just end here, era Arsenio Rodriguez, y después había Benny Morey. Benny Morey, yo iba a tocar en el club. He came to, to the club, um, and that was very important. And then um, you have, at the end, the statue of Martí without Marcel. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your patience a few minutes ago. I'm going to be reading my uh, piece because I'm too tired to, uh, uh, to dramatize it. I really appreciate uh, the fact that it really flows much better when we talk about things, but um, I'll try to do uh, a bit of talking in between the lines. The, uh, um, so my talk today is about hostos, and you may wonder uh, what is hostos doing here in the middle of habaneros, right? Uh, he, he's not an habanero. He, you know, did not ever set foot in Cuba. Um, 
and uh, um, did not have any relatives coming from Cuba, except an old grand great-grandfather who actually came from Matanzas. And uh, the issue here is one of choice rather than one of uh, biology. He, I will argue, is an important Cuban habanero, mostly out of his deeds and uh, what he accomplished and the work of support and solidarity that he did so that Cuba could become independent. So uh, he was an exceptional non-habanero, and I think that um, some of you may know that the Center for Martí Studies in Havana uh, that has done uh, a lot of work publishing uh, Martí's work. Uh, so the scholar who was supposed to, who wrote actually the introduction to the book that has not been published yet, uh, which is the Ostos and Cuba uh, volume of the critical editions of the Ostos uh, complete works in his introduction study, titles is the study, Ostos Patriota Cubano, Ostos a Cuban Patriot. So to explain Rodriguez, uh, the, the guy I'm talking about, his honoring title, let it be said that Ostos wrote profusely about Cuba, starting with his articles in the press in Madrid during the mid 1860s and later in New York City during the 10 year war. In April of 1875, he joined Francisco Vicente Aguilera's failed military expedition aboard the Charles Miller that had to re return to safe port on account of a storm high seas and a defective ship. Between late 1869 and the spring of 1874, Ostos went on an extended three and a half year journey throughout South America to promote support for the Cuban independence war, writing in the press, creating support organizations, and organizing rallies for Cuba. He later worked alongside General Luperón, Ramón Eveterio Betances, and exiled Cubans that were li living in uh, Puerto Plata between 1875 and 77 to support the war effort. During the third war for Cubans' independence, I'm, I'm referring to Martí's war after the La Guerra Chica, no? La Guerra Chiquita. Uh, this time, most of us was in Chile. And there he helped to organize and support a committee to send money, arms, and men to fight in Cuba. Moreover, while in Chile, he wrote 57 public letters about Cuba, which helped to explain to Latin America why the Cubans were fighting for their independence and the right to do so. It was also while he, living, while he was living in Santiago in 1877 that he wrote a beautiful short story, some of you may know, titled In a Paper Boat. Um, so, um, he was there, as some researchers have suggested, uh, there's uh, some documental evidence that the campaign to disparage Osto's performance as director of the Liceo Munategui in Santiago de Chile in 1897 was motivated by the government that had good commercial and diplomatic ties with Spain. Uh, an inspector wrote in his report that Osto's had performed inappropriately in the administration of examinations. This was indeed a ruse to try to defame him under pressure, Ostos resigned and at the beginning of 1898, left the country for New York. A big part of that solidarity and political support for Cuba took place while Ostos was in New York City during his various sojourns between 1869 and 1876. So I want to talk about Ostos in New York City and his solidarity work with Cuba. The, fels, the battle annex, against annexation in New York City during that period as some speakers mentioned earlier, Lisandro, in a divided uh, community, so to speak. Ostos arrived in October 30, 1869 at New York in, with the about purpose of organizing an uprising against the Spanish colonial regime in Puerto Rico and supporting Cuba's revolution for independence. He worked during the next five months as a staff writer in the newspaper La Revolución de Cuba y Puerto Rico that was the organ of the Cuban agency led by Jose Mestre and Aldama Group, exiled in New York. The big issue confronting Cuba independence leaders, besides fighting the Spanish army, was how to approach relations to the United States and what the final outcome of those relations sh should be, independence or the annexation to the United States. The policy agreed upon by Céspedes and the independence leaders was to postpone any discussion of the final political status of Cuba and to maintain unity until after attaining independence. 
The issue faced in the United States government was how to treat the Cuban insurgency. President Ulysses Grant, during the 1868 campaign, had encouraged the Cuban uprising against Spain, but soon after his administration took over, his Secretary of State, Fish, pursued a case reparations against England, which had recognized the belligerency status of uh, uh, the Confederacy, and actually supported uh, with arms and money um, against the um, Union armies. So trying to avoid any appearances of inconsistency, Fish argued against recognizing the Cuban belligerency, but perhaps there was a deeper explanation which had been described as the policy of the ripe apple, which assumed that the United States would benefit from annexing the Caribbean island when the time was ripe. This was, as you might know, something that was uh, put forth in, uh, by Madison back in the 1820s. And it was called that, the, the, you know, the, the policy of the ripe, ripe apple. We will not an, uh, annex Cuba, we will not take over Cuba, but when the time is ripe, Cuba will fall and we will be happy to um, bring it in as a territory or as whatever other arrangement that southern politicians wanted it to be a slave st state. That changed completely after the Civil War. Um, <laughs> so, um, the Cuban political exiles, including the agency of the Republican arms based in New York City, who had devoted a great deal of effort to help shape Grant's policy in that direction, felt betrayed. When Ostos arrived, he was offered a position as staff writer in the newspaper La Revolución, um, and his thinking, which had evolved towards the end of his, his stay in Spain, towards pro-independence views and a very strong anti-annexationist anti conviction. That may have been influenced by Jose Antonio Sacco. As you know, Sacco was an important uh, thinker and uh, uh, economist uh, who spent time uh, in Cuba uh, addressing some of these issues, but also was forced to leave the island uh, and spent time in Europe. He had a very strong relationship with the Sacarogradas, the, the uh, owners of plantations, and, and he also had a, a strong relationship with other intellectuals from the Sociedad de Amigos del País. So, um, Sacco moves from a uh, pro-annexationist view of what Cuba should become part of the United States to a radically anti-annexationist position. And the book is published in the 1850, 1851, it's uh, against annexation. Mm -hmm. Ostos reads this book, knows about uh, his uh, uh, new position, and actually uh, uses some of his terminology in dealing with annexationist politics. So in, in 1867, when um, Sacco is uh, a member of the inf informational uh, committee, commission in Spain, uh, Ostos is in touch with him in, in Madrid. Um, so, Ostos became a major opponent of the annexation of the Antilles to the United States. He rejected the attempt by the Grant administration to annex Haiti and Santo Domingo in two articles published uh, in La Revolución, in which he condemned the United States' expansionist policies in the Caribbean and its alliance with dictators, and particularly since uh, uh, it was dealing with two new black republics, as they were considered then, both in Santo Domingo and Haiti were uh, largely black uh, populations. And uh, the big hero uh, at the time was someone that may be somewhat forgotten. His name was Charles Sumner, the uh, uh, senator from Massachusetts, who actually was a major and very distinguished, distinguished and abolitionist in, in during the pre-Civil War uh, period and, and a collaborator of Lincoln. Uh, and so, so Sumner uh, is uh, opposed radically opposed to the annexation of these two countries. So Ostos will actually help to form public opinion by publishing articles that rejected annexation for several reasons, including the fact that this was a very undemocratic um, ruse that had been put together by two dictators who simply wanted to salvage their own regimes and uh, who were corrupt and fiercely anti-democratic. Um, the reasons for pursuing an annexationist policy by Grant are various, and uh, I think that they have been discussed. This, suffice it to say that one that is particularly interesting is, has to do with 
his own concern that the federal troops would not be able to control the, um, the killings of blacks in the South. In his memoirs, you read that Grant is saying that they didn't know what could, could, they could do if the occupation failed and if they could not really control the violence against blacks and that perhaps they would have to send U.S. blacks to, Dominica, to Santo Domingo. That, that in itself is a very interesting and very problematic idea. But that's at least, his, he writes this from his bed uh, uh, while he's dying, and it's, uh, it's important that at least we should consider the degree to which this concerned the, the uh, federal administration. There was also the issue of you know, agriculture, resources, and of course, fundamental, you know, a Navy uh, position in uh, um, uh, the northern part of the Dominican Republic, uh, in the peninsula of Samana, uh, they wanted to have a, a coal, coaling station, and that was really not possible, but the Navy was really pushing very hard for that. The United States was actually moving into the Caribbean. They, they tried to do then the coaling station in Haiti. When that didn't work out in the, uh, in, in 90s, the, in the 80s, actually, they did the final option was what, you know, the Guantanamo uh, base. So, Ostos became a major opponent of the annexation of Antilles, and he rejected the attempt by the Grand Administration. Um, an attempt to resolve the Cuban Ten-Year War came about at the beginning of, the 18, of 1870 when the Spanish reformist regime, after the 1868 uh, revolution in Spain, explored the idea of selling Cuba and Puerto Rico to the United States. F Cuba for $100 million uh, and Puerto Rico for $25 million. Uh, and again, uh, there was a tepid rejection by the newspaper where Ostos was working because they felt as annexationists that this would open a possibility of uh, at least getting closer to a, a, a solution that would be favorable to their position. But Ostos was indeed very opposed to any such resolution because he actually believed that this was a completely undemocratic uh, manipulation and that if there was anything that had to uh, that was going to be affecting the uh, peoples of Cuba and Puerto Rico, that they should have at least some say in their future. Um, so, during his various days in New York City, Ostos published in other newspapers after resigning from uh, La Revolución, the Revolution, and he published in, amongst them in El Correo de Nueva York, La Independencia, El Demócrata, and El Nuevo Mundo, La América Ilustrada. Uh, the Articles I would like to just comment briefly, written by Ostos in New York City, have to do with precisely Cuba and Puerto Rico and their um, um, relationship with the Caribbean the proposal for a confederation of the Antilles. Uh, so the first of these two is an article that uh, my friend David Cortez and I were able to retrieve a few months ago in Chile uh, in the National Library where we were looking for other, other documents and it turns out that Ostos wrote this document in New York. It's called uh, Credo of Cuba and Puerto Rico. And it, it addresses the issues that have to do with uh, the right to independence, the um, race issue, how Ostos saw that, in fact, uh, the uh, racial um, configuration of uh, populations had little to do with their intelligence or their uh, value as human beings. And therefore, he proposed an interpretation of the whole uh, evolution uh, very differently than other politicians at the time. He thought that the, the mixture of races was going to be inevitable that civilization was moving in that direction. And that indeed, a uh, mixture of uh, it, blacks, what we call Ethiopic then, and uh, European and Indian and European was not only um, a fact, but also uh, important for the civilization to move forward. And that is something which is very few uh, thinkers of the time had been talking about or even uh, proposing. At the time, anything that had to do with mixture was seen as, as, as uh, inferior and uh, unable to really match the concept that was not completely stated of you know, whiteness, or pure whiteness or even pure blackness to some extent. So this is really uh, a, uh, an interesting contribution that he does to uh, race relations. He's 
proposals that uh, El Mestizo or El Mulato are, are the future in Latin America. In Peru, he does the same thing when he travels through Peru. He talks about the Peruvian uh, Cholo as being the future of the country. Um, so, in uh, um, defending Cuba and Puerto Rico as um, the two important uh, Antilles, the Dominican Republic was already independent, although it had to defend its sovereignty a number of times. Um, Ostos is actually pursuing a, both a strategy of the times and a uh, need of, to recognize the uh, countries that had been or were being ex exploited, the colonial uh, administrations came from Spain and from other countries that actually had been uh, very um, decidedly impoverishing of the uh, two islands. If you looked at Puerto Rico at the time, it was very, very uh, limited in its um, ability to produce uh, intellectual as well as social uh, levels of uh, uh, humanity that you may actually um, show for their own, um, for, the, for the relationship that was being um, uh, challenged with Spain. The same thing happened with Cuba. You know, the distribution of wealth was very uh, lopsided and they did have a tremendous amount of progress, but it was really uh, at the top of the um, um, economic um, ladder. So, in uh, writing about uh, these uh, topics, particularly the uh, relationship between Cuba and Puerto Rico, also will highlight the need to recognize the two of them and the, the fact that they are indeed undergoing uh, colonial exploitation that has to be um, rejected. Um, and that the only way that could be done would be through sharing um, the forces of the um, both um, intellectually and uh, the fighting that would bring about a uh, downfall of the colonial regime. You may recall that Lola Rodriguez de Tio, the poet, uh, also has a similar um, uh, lyrical approach when she talks about Cuba and Puerto Rico being the same uh, wings of, of the same bird, I should say. Uh, the experience of oppression would also inform one of the tenets of Martí's outlook and political strategy, and I would, uh, it would drive dozens of Puerto Ricans to fight the La Manigua and to support the Cuba's war effort. In La Manigua, I should say. Thus, the creation of the Puerto Rican section of the Cuban Revolutionary Party in New York in 1896 and the strong efforts of the Puerto Rican Afro descendants, who became a close collaborator of Martí and supported the racial democracy that Martí put forth along with his political ideas in Patria, I'm referring to uh, Sotero Figueroa. Um, the uh, newspaper that Martí founded, Patria, for um, conducting uh, the war effort and developing support among the communities in uh, New York and the rest of the United States uh, was originally located on Pearl Street, but it soon moved to the same building where Rafael Serra Montalvo had founded a night school for black and Puerto Rican Cuban workers, Cuban and Puerto Rican black workers, I should say. Uh, Martí and Sotero Figueroa were teachers in that school, and uh, uh, Sotero Figueroa was the printer of the uh, um, Patria newspaper. So the issue of race also takes uh, center space in Osto's credo. Uh, at a time when the offspring of racial mixture was considered inferior, Osto speaks of this process as inherently natural. So uh, Osto's, of course, you know, has some utopian uh, proposals and uh, they're far from being, having been fulfilled but it is highly significant that both Osto and Marti would think about the issue of racial progress as intrinsically connected to the aspirations for independence to the Antilles. It implies that refashioning of the relations in the, relations in the new republics, a clear sense that the social foundations had to be reformed to make them inclusive. That Rafael Serra, who after Marti died, published a newspaper called La Doctrina Marti, as was mentioned earlier, and Sotero Figueroa, both black and Tilian journalists would be so central to the unrealized vision of Martí. Uh, this has been recognized as a goal for the new racial democracy that independence could harbor. There are two other significant documents at the beginning of 1870 in Panama, as Osos was starting his journey to the south, 
uh, where he writes an important essay titled At, at the Isthmus, and uh, where he expounds the idea of the Antillean Confederation. Um, the other one is one of the fundamental uh, writings of uh, uh, precursors of the human rights uh, uh, doctrine, and he wrote that in New York City, 1875. Uh, the title is The Platform for the Independientes, and in these two documents, he's addressing issues that have to do centrally with Cuban experience in New York and in, uh, on the island. Um, the, the manifesto that was, he wrote as a, the title, The Platform for the Independientes, uh, and was requested by Jose Guantes for a, a, a newspaper, um, actually uh, proposes the principle of equality as an outstanding contribution to human rights and puts Ostos at the forefront of universal thinking. Uh, I would like to just quickly, before I finish, quote from that um, document so that you get an idea of what his thinking is about. Uh, so Ostos writes, a man does not cease to be a man because his skin is either light or dark, or equally because he comes from the Caucasian or Mongolian or Ethiopian or American or Malash Malaysian branch of the human species. A rational being does not cease to be rational because his native citizenship is Karawali, Tagala, Chinese, Japanese, or European. Whatever his color, whatever his nationality, a human being is the same rational being anywhere. Therefore, everywhere he's owed the consideration that comes with the morality, dignity, and activity of his nature. So you have Ostos addressing the issue of equality, but making a note of specific ethnic groups that uh, we would now call the third world or non-Western non societies. And that, I think, is uh, probably uh, one way that he uh, used to uh, take a perspective that was non-Western or to view things from a, a, a Western perspective that was not necessarily uh, loaded with the history of racism that uh, uh, we now know, right, in, in this country and all of Latin America and other parts of the world. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to finish, right, uh, the uh, other part of this document was the principle of nationhood, which establishes the freedom of peoples to constitute themselves in nations. And although this is all um, a, a statement of uh, ideas, a manifesto, if you will, uh, Ostos is doing this for a Cuban group in the name of promoting the Cuban independence movement. Um, so I have not counted uh, uh, all the, all the uh, articles and pieces of writings and, um, and diary uh, entries that Ostos wrote about uh, Cuba and to support the independence uh, of Cuba and dealing with Cuban issues. I believe it's probably around 100. Uh, many of them actually very specifically di directed to issues that uh, were being uh, debated at the time. The 57 public letters that he wrote in uh, Chile are a strong sampling, if you like, of his commitment and his uh, uh, great uh, uh, contribution to Cuban independence. I'd like to just uh, finish by uh, saying that uh, Ostos, in a sense, does not need to prove anything beyond what he's done. So it would be indeed uh, our uh, pleasure to confer him the title of Honorary Habanero. Thank you. I am Ana Maria Hernandez from La Guardia Community College, where I direct Latin American studies. I have a question for Lisandro. I read his book, which is absolutely fascinating. And at one point, he uh, chronicles how Aldama spent a, co a fortune establishing a refinery in Brooklyn, and I would like to know, I mean, uh, what happened? Uh, he, it, it never became operational. Was it that he ran out of money? Was it that there was opposition from other refineries uh, in the area? That's my question. Okay, so, so I have in the, uh, in, in the book, I have this case of the Adama refinery, which he called the Santa Rosa refinery, which he started building in the Red Hook area uh, of Brooklyn. Um, and um, it, was an, it was interesting for two things. One is what Adama wanted to do was to sort of have a ver vertical integration of his, of his sort of uh, 
economic activity. He just didn't want to sell his sugar. Right? When he went back to Cuba, by the way, in other words, he, keep in mind that his properties have been embargoed in Cuba in 1869, right? But he was hoping to go back and recover them. So he felt that if he went back and recovered his plantations, then he could, you know, uh, not have to sell his sugar in New York. He could bring it to New York and refine it in New York himself. So he wanted to sort of, uh, you know, control the whole process from beginning to end, right, in terms of the sugar refining process. But it, so that was interesting from that point of view. The other thing was that it was this tremendous, I mean, the New York Times did a whole article on this, on, on the building of the refinery. It had a chimney that was, you know, huge and everything. I mean, it was, a, it was a big thing. And this is at the same time that he's presumably the agent general of the Republic of Cuba, uh, where they're trying to raise money, right, for the Cuban cause. And it's, you know, difficult to do so. And, and there's Aguilera struggling. He comes here and he's, you know, barely has enough to pay his rent and everything else. And here's the representante the, you know, of, of the Cuban government essentially spending all this money on the refinery. So this was part of what really um, created um, this, um, uh, this division in the, com in the community whereby many, many people, of course, uh, uh, heavily criticized what were became known as the Aldanistas, and especially the people from the West. I'm not sure what happened to the refinery. It never really went operational at all. That is, the war ends. Um, uh, Adama eventually goes back and tries to recover his property, which he does not. Um, supposedly, he dies in poverty, but a lot of Cuban historians have, have questioned that, that that's not true. Um, and he eventually, you know, um, came back when he died. He died in Havana, and he said he wanted to be brought back to Greenwood uh, to be buried in the, in the mausoleum where his wife and his father, he built that mausoleum where his wife and his, 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 um, and his father uh, are buried. So I don't know exactly what happened to the to the refinery, but I, I know he ran out of money. Essentially, he did, he wasn't able to recuperate his properties. Right? So I've I've always um, I, I think there's a lot to be criticized about Aldama. I think also he's been really really criticized by most Cuban historians for that reason, not having a. There's a quote from Aguilera, who of course is an Easterner from Bayamo, to Tomas Tra Palma, where he says about the sugarocrats, he says. Our, our revolution has suffered immeasurably from our lack of understanding of the men of the West, right? And that's, that's really revealing, right, in terms of, of saying about this conflict. But the refinery, uh, it's over by, the, by the, what was called the Buttermilk Channel. Uh, I think there's, a, uh, there's no streets there anymore. There's a parking, uh, there's sort of a parking for uh, commercial vehicles that, that is actually on top of the um, Hugh Carey uh, Tunnel. It's in that area. Yeah, it was because after that, actually, I think that was the uh, place where later on there was a beer, a brewery that made that India, a uh, certain India Pale, Brooklyn, whatever, in the 1930s, I believe. I'm Raquel Otegui. I'm a professor in the history department at uh, Bronx Community College. Um, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. It occurs to me that the narrative that has kind of, or to me, the narrative that I've been hearing since this morning when Elena and Orlando gave their tour, and uh, including uh, Nancy and Lisandro's talk, is in some ways the Latinization of Cubans, that is the racialization of Cubans as Latinos in the United States and in New York. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if all three of you can kind of speak a little bit to that. Like, for example, I'm, I'm curious about um, the Cuban boys placed in schools that Lisandro talks about in his books. How are they perceived? Are they perceived as elite Latin Americans who are white, or are they increasingly perceived as Latinos? And I suspect that there's also a, a sort of temporal shift as the 19th century wears on between the sort of folks that Lisandro talks about and then the, the folks that Nancy talks about. Um, where uh, the presence of more working class Cubans and more Cubans of African descent then um, not only affect how the Cuban national, how Guanida is defined, um, positively I think, um, but also then might, might affect how they're perceived by, you know, sort of by American society. So if you guys could kind of speak to that question a little bit, uh, I'd be interested. Um, okay, so do I need to do this? I don't think this is on, <laughs> it's not turned on. Uh, is it turned on? Oh, yes, it is. I have to talk like this. Okay. Um, so that's a good question. I mean, you know, I look at the 19th century as well, and so it's, I focus mostly on, because I knew Lisandro was going to do that presentation, but um, mostly in focus, but I do look at the 19th century, and 
My reading of the 19th century when I look at that work is that the Cubans who come, um, especially when you look at the sun and um, with the flag and the newspapers and La Verdad. So La Verdad is also, um, there are a lot of US kind of support for annexationists. In short, my reading is that many of the Cubans who come are not seen as white on some level by the United States. That's your question. By US, they're seen as a certain kind of foreign whiteness, but one that they can work with, right? Um, and it's interesting because Domingo de Cucuria, who goes in and he works with Lorenzo Alo, and he's, he actually will go to Nicaragua. And so I talk about how he goes to Nicaragua with William Walker. And then there's also, in the book, I also write about that many of the Cubans who organize all of these clubs, El Club de los Independientes, these, these clubs, Juan Fraga, for instance, is white. But Juan Fraga himself, in the 19th century, doesn't see himself as white in terms of US whiteness. So there's this real complication, and he organizes a really important club called Club de los Independientes. When Sotero Figueroa comes from Puerto Rico, says this is the only club to belong to. And he really wants it to be a racially mixed club. And so it, it's, for me, race and gender and class are really key in understanding this community. And for me, couldn't be separated. Because I think upper class Cubans who went to private school, who had these connections, had a certain definition of whiteness that wasn't necessarily shared in the 19th century by working class white Cubans like Juan Fraga, perhaps, or even like Martí, um, who were kind of trying to figure, and Jose Antonio Saco, as you mentioned, they were reading Saco, but Saco was also a part of this trying to make sense of whiteness, right? His whole thing with Cuba was really about, okay, we want to do away with slavery, but that means that the island's going to be majority you know, black or mulatto, which was a big deal, and what do we do around whiteness? So they're reading Saco because that becomes an anxiety that is taking place at that time. So it's a good question, but that's how I was reading it in terms of their work and the way that, because that language isn't there at that time, but the way that I perceived it was through labor organizing. So when you read Martin Moro Delgado, La Cuestión del Obrero, when you read like, the labor organizing, the unions. I mean, that's where there is an organizing around what is the future of Kuanida and is that future of Kuanida one that is racially mixed? And that's when you get Martí, ser cubano más que negro, más que mulato, más que blanco, right? Because that's part of that whole conversation. They're trying to figure out what does it mean to be Cuban after the revolution. But that discourse is one slow in coming. It's one that 1820s has a different way, 1830s, 1840s. And so when you have El Mulato, which I showed, Carlos de Collins, who was the editor of El Mulato, is white, right? He doesn't see himself, though, in the same whiteness as the Aldamas and as the Madans and as these slaveholders and landholders. He sees himself very differently. And El Mulato, in a way, is a call, is a challenge to them, saying, get your act together because this is the future. The future is, as you mentioned, as they were thinking about, is one that we need to think about racially mixture. Is it one that, and that's what caught the attention of Martin Delaney and Frederick Douglass, who were African Americans, when they said, wow, what is this thing called mulatto? We don't talk about mulatto, <laughs> you know, mulattos. And they have this newspaper. And then African Americans begin to get in that conversation as well. Yeah. So j let me just uh, briefly throw in uh, uh, a couple of thoughts on this. Um, I, I did an emphasis here in the presentation, and as well as in the beginning of the book, precisely on the Sakarokratas, right? In, in large measure, because um, I think that's where the origins of the community lie, in this commerce, right? And in order to understand that commerce, you have to kind of focus on these. I did not have the um, intention of focusing on any particular group and to try to tease out these kinds of racial uh, there's where my training as a sociologist comes out in the sense that I, when I approached this topic, I said, uh, instead of looking first at the archives and everything, I said, I want to look at the census. Right? So I have, I have literally all of the census forms that have any Cuban uh, uh, born, in, um, uh, born in Cuba and living in New York in the 1850, 1860, 1870, 1880 census. Right? Those are, those, I, I tease those out of the, which you can do now digitally. And so I looked at the data, and, and I was looking at a racial composition that was very heavily white, right? Especially up, up until about 1880, right? 1870, 
shows that it, it was primarily a, a white community. That is not to say that there weren't Afro-Cubans and, and others, but again, I'm trying to see why it is that this community become, why it is that, that especially in 1870, all these Cubans come here, and I'm trying to trace that back to this sugar commerce. So I am emphasizing, I am in that sense emphasizing the, the sugar, sugar aggrats. And it's important to keep in mind, I think, I, I don't know if I answered your question about their definition of race. I, the, I can tell you that they were viewed, they were viewed as a, a distinctly foreign group, right? And, and they were also a distinctly foreign group from the point of view that, that for New Yorkers entering you know, this period of modernity, right, they are this, this, this class that comes in with this whiff of old world you know, coming from a, a, a European colony. Right? And, and not only that, they're hanging out in Saratoga. You know, I mean, you know, with every, with the elites, I mean, you know, when you look at the, uh, at some of the events, you have the mayor of New York, I mean, you know, they, they did um, establish tremendous connections here very early with, with a lot of the elite of New York, right? And, and I, I'm not sure I can answer that question about, about race. I, I think they were definitely for, and I think those, those students who came here, uh, it's fascinating to look at the correspondence that they had with the, Moses Taylor, because they're sent out, imagine, these are children of privilege in Cuba, uh, who then are thrown in here, in somewhere in New Jersey, not there's anything wrong in New Jersey, <laughs> New Jersey, or, or in the Hudson Valley, in, in, a, in a boarding school, in a language they don't understand, with cold, right, and they're a problem, right, they're constantly complaining, and they're, you know, I, I mean, I think they see themselves distinctly as part of an elite, right, that is, that is not what they're supposed to be, and they're going back to Cuba anyway, right, so, so I, I don't think they had that issue of, of, of I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question in racial terms, other than they were, they were, they were definitely uh, an, an elite, right? And they saw themselves that way. Can I ask a quick follow-up? So how did those people then react to the more multiracial nature of the sense of millennia that comes up later? Well, I, th I think part of what happens is that there's a transition, you know, in, in, um, that, that you can see demographically, right? when at the tail end of the war, you do start having a very large number of particularly of Afro-Cuban cigar workers coming in. So that the 1880 census, the 1880 census is, is quite different, right, uh, in, in that composition. Besides, many of those that I put up there as being in the 1870 census, with some exceptions, go back to Cuba, right? I mean, uh, Antonio Archieri Morales, I mean, you name it, all of those people went back to Cuba, in part also taught argue for their property. Uh, and to have their property returned, which they never did. No, it's okay. I, yeah. I, I, think it, I think it's an important question that needs research. For example, in terms of the Puerto Rican community, um, which was very uh, significantly uh, smaller, yeah, uh, it, the, the question really needs research in terms of the Puerto Rican community. For example, there is a um, much smaller number of Puerto Ricans who come here until uh, the 90s, really. You know, there, there's a, then I think you'd start to see both the tabaqueros and uh, professionals to some extent. Uh, and you could see that in the list of those who were supporting the Puerto Rican section, uh, their names, uh, those that can be recognized. Uh, and then there were workers too, white workers. Uh, but the experience is quite different. Being in a place like New York, where evidently uh, racial mixtures are probably um, a daily thing in the factories, right? Um, and yet, I, I do know the conflicts that have that existed in the uh, Cuban Revolution, in Cuba, Puerto Rican section of the Cuban Revolutionary Party. Some of them actually referred to uh, race and the lack of participation of uh, blacks to the extent that they were turned off uh, by uh, a, a much more uh, white, if you like, Puerto Rican. Uh, uh, sense of um, you know, power that, so it's still very much at the level of uh, research as far as I can, I can. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted to add like one of the things that in the 1850s and the 1860s, there were Cuban revolutionary clubs organized by Afro-Cubans. They didn't just come in as cigar workers, right? They also came in as organizers. Many did come as cigar workers, but they did. And they began to travel to Mexico, Haiti, 
they go to Central America. Haiti alone had about 11 different Cuban revolutionary clubs of people who had exiled in Haiti in Santo Domingo. There were several clubs, as Hija de Ma Antonio Maceo. So, you know, that's one of the things that I looked at, which is, you know, that yes, Afro-Cubans come to work in the cigar factory during the 10 years war, but they also come as journalists, revolutionaries, writers, and they travel a great deal through the Americas pushing and trying to get support for the revolutionary effort in Puerto Rico and in Cuba. And what I found was interesting was that Maceo was at, was at the forefront of this kind of organizing. And Maceo's the general of the 10 years war. But he's also available before, I mean, he's, he, people know him before the 10 years war. So yeah, and Argentina, Venezuela, all these places had Cuban revolutionary exile clubs. Mary Roldan, I'm the chair of the history department at Hunter. I really enjoyed this, this was absolutely fascinating. And I have a question for Nancy. Um, I'm really interested in the Afro-Cuban uh, clubs that got organized in the early, part of the 20, early to mid part of the 20th century. In my own work, which I work on Colombia, I see how a number of individuals actually end up working in the centrales mm -hmm. in Cuba in the 20s and 30s. They'll become journalists, then they'll come to New York, they'll work in the graveyard shift covering crime, and then they'll go back and become, say, radio personalities. And, but the question that I have is, um, are you seeing uh, these Cuban clubs becoming inspirational for other Latin American groups, for instance, that are located in the city? One, and two, is there, just as you've noted, uh, the traveling and the establishment of Cuban revolutionary clubs during the late 19th century, is there something comparable in the 20th century that you see? Well, okay, not an easy question, but yeah, good one. Um, so there was, so there's several key things that happen. Uh, one is the Machadato, right? And Gerardo Machano in the 1920s and the 1930s in Cuba and the repression, and that's what leads, I argue, in, in, you see this in the census data that a large number of Cubans begin to leave in the 1920s, late 1920s, early 30s, for New York. And I feel like that's a migration that doesn't get enough attention. And it's actually a very racialized migration as well. You see a lot of people coming into New York of all places. And that's when you get, for instance, um, Ruiz Suarez, Fernando Ruiz Suarez, uh, who writes about coming to La Habana, I mean, coming from La Habana to New York in the 1920s. Um, and so you have the Machadato, number one. That's why Melba came, because her father was threatened by a soldier in the Machadato and said, you know, either you leave or you're, you're gonna be found in the sugar cane. He was Puerto Rican, so he was able to get out and get his family to leave. And then there was also, um, so those clubs begin to organize in protest to Machado. That's the reason El Club Julio Antonio Mella gets organized, and it says it in their bylaws, as a way for Cubans to organize against Machado. So that's one of them. And then there was Pablo Torrente Brau, who wrote a really wonderful book. He's a journalist. He's white. He's a journalist. And he writes about coming to the United, coming to New York, um, and how he began to organize and work with people who are organizing all these different clubs that are not only Cubans, but I, I have it here was like a lot of Latin American revolutionaries come at the same time. So you're going to have the Colombian clubs. You're going to have clubs, you know, from different Caribbean countries and so forth and organize. Jesu Colon is very active in that organizing as well. So, and also the Spanish Civil War. And then there's a rise of internationalism that many of these organizers begin to think about. Um, and again, it's another moment of what does it mean, you know, the nation state for them has failed as people of color, right? Especially in Cuba, when you go back and you have the race war of 1912 and you have all of these problems that you realize, okay, you know, this is not gonna work for us. Um, and so then you have Machado, that's not gonna work for you. So then when you come to Cuba, you begin to, when you go to New York, you begin to envision, is there a future of an internationalist future where you're working with other Latin American revolutionaries, other kind of people of color in, in New York, and, and that's where 
Um, and I focused on a Club Julio Antonio Mella, which was enough work to research and find that club. But there were, you look at the IWO, they're organizing the Polish, the Russian, the Irish, everybody. And they're all in conversation with each other. But if you're interested in that, I would look at um, the biography that well, Pablo Torrente Brau, eh, un, un soldado desconocido, or something like that. I can give you the citation. It's a, it's a brilliant book, and he really, through first person account, tells you everything that's taking place at that time. He was half Puerto Rican. He was half Puerto Rican. Ahí mismo, mira. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Mira eso. No, 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 gracias, gracias. That was precisely one of the questions I, I would like to ask you. Pablo de la Torriente stopped over in New York on his way to the Civil War. Exactly. And there's a book, it's called Moriré en Cuba or something like that. I, I have a copy of that book. Mm. But my, my larger question was all those uh, 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 Afro-Cuban clubs, what the connection with or as to the nacionalistas Puerto Ricanos in the 1930s and 1940s, mm -hmm. Albizu uh, resided in New York mm -hmm. from 43 to 47. Who was funded? Who was funding Albizu Campos? Uh, there are uh, three short memoirs that may help you out. Mm -hmm. Oscar Collazo, mm -hmm. Oscar Collazo's wife, and Oscar Collazo's stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. They are very short, but they, they may have references as to connections with the, the Afro-Cuban community in New York City. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Briefly, I, I want to just comment briefly. Um, Alvisu was here. Um, after they were um, freed from Atlanta. Yeah, and, uh, and they were for, forbidden to go back to Puerto Rico due to the um, war. Um, there were other nationalists, including um, Clemente Soto Vélez and Correjer. And, um, and Alviso had to stay uh, beyond the 1945, uh, I think, or 46 uh, date that would allow them to return to Puerto Rico because he was sick. And he spent time um, as, uh, <coughs> um, re re recovering um, in the Presbyterian uh, Hospital in this city. And I remember having talking to some friends, um, maybe it was Jerry Meyer who, uh, who mentioned that to me. I asked him, well, you know, how, what uh, what he was doing here, and why? Why was he? Uh, uh, how, how was he supported? And and Alviso, who had uh, for some time had some very sharp differences with the Communist Party, uh, at that time was also supported by Vito Marcantonio. And Jerry tells me that the Communist Party helped to pay his uh, hospital bills. They were together at the Atlanta prison. Mm. Um, we've gone over our time. There's food. Uh, there's some drink. I don't know if there are any other questions. And if you have them, fantastic. Um, the yeah. panelists will be here. Uh, uh, and you can uh, certainly approach them. Thank you all for coming. You. Uh, you are a wonderful audience. Thank you.